Um, I am very excited to talk to you. And, and I was just out walking my dog and I was thinking, oh, uh, when did we first meet? And I just remembered when. We were at Princeton University. Oh, my goodness. <laughs> it's a, <laughs> yeah. it's a, it's I, a time. <laughs> yeah. uh, I had just recorded a podcast with then Barbell Shrugged. And then I was um, scheduled to have a lecture in the, the next door um, uh, room from where I recorded the podcast. And as I was about to enter to uh, the lecture, I saw you standing there waiting to go in. And I said, I hope Dr. Romanoff is not coming to my lecture because this is going to make me really nervous. And yes, you did. And you sat in the front and uh, it was an amazing experience. So I, 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 that, that was my memory of you, the first memory. I I put in my mind this um, um, to hear what you have been s thinking to say, <laughs> and I'm a very curious guy, <laughs> you know. So that's why I'm taking first row to be closer <laughs> to the uh, the source of um, knowledge. And, and you didn't disappoint me. Don't worry. <laughs> mm -hmm. <laughs> no, no, no pressure. No pressure. <laughs> Anyways, I, I want to talk about everything, pose method, uh, life, uh, uh, performance. Uh, my first question is, these days, what do you spend most of your time thinking about? Oh, thinking about, oh, it's um, about my wife, you know. <laughs> Good answer. <laughs> yes, it's um, uh, my favorite lady in the world. <clears throat> Uh, but besides this, uh, I'm thinking about my kids, my grandkids, and uh, simultaneously in a parallel uh, reality, I'm thinking about science. It's still inside me, and uh, it's like a burning coals. Uh, it's um, nonstop, you know, <laughs> burning things since I entered a long time ago into this field. And uh, God bless, I didn't lose this <laughs> desire to go more into this. It's uh, a very exciting thoughts. And uh, in the recent years, uh, I got the privilege and uh, my kids made possible to dedicate to these things more time, which um, I'm happy about. Yeah, that it's wonderful. It's it, it seems like it's also a yeah, it's become a family business, which is which is wonderful to to see that happening. And I'm curious, uh, w w we're going to get into pose, of course, and everything that you've discovered over the years. But before we even get into that, I'm also curious. You continue to teach these days, yes, and I do. when yeah, when you're teaching, where are uh people's minds what are they thinking about what questions are they asking are they new questions or are they the same questions that you were hearing back in the 70s <laughs> and, uh, i would like to give you a polite answer <laughs> <laughs> um it, it, we have a um, a very famous um, novel of mikhail bulgakov in soviet union in in russia it's called Master and Margarita. And I'll, t I'll take the liberty to send you an English copy of this that you will know what I'm talking about. And there are uh, uh, evil, or not devil, <laughs> by the name of Boland came to Moscow and have been watching people, how they act. And this guy lived forever, you understand? He, and he was a friend of the god <laughs> uh, opposite kind of <laughs> friend but still and uh, he expressed himself uh, um, as a conclusion about people on the modern time in in soviet union at that time and he told well people are the same they still love money they still want to love <laughs> and they they still uh possessed with some things, you know, like uh, uh, material things. <laughs> it's a pity 
nothing new in this world. <laughs> so, so hopefully the aliens、uh, are real then, and, <laughs> and 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 we'll get something new. Right. You see, for me as a, as a scientist,、um, I'm always expecting maybe unfounded expectation, but <laughs> nevertheless, I'm expecting they would. Ask me about most、uh, crucial, most、uh, puzzling <laughs> questions and problems which exist in our field where I happen to be working all my life. But it's not, <laughs> and、oh, well, this is <laughs> this is a polite answer, and then I have to pick up conversation. Our discussion, chat, and move them in their mind into real important things for them. You know,、uh, people's minds are all like that. They don't know what really they need. They think they do know what they need, but not. <laughs> they really concern about things what they don't need to be concerned about. <laughs> And they don't concern about things what they should be concerned about. <laughs> could you could you give me an example of some of those? Oh, absolutely. Oh, for example, in it's closer to our field,、um, and it's called、uh, I call it conceptual frame、um, controversy. It goes like that: muscles, physiology, or Uh, external environmental sources,、mm -hmm. and people always thinking about their own muscles, their capacity, physiology development, which is dumb, really, you know, because science already a long time ago already answered on this question, pretty much square, <laughs> that we cannot develop physiology. <laughs> Our physiology is a product of the environmental influence, and the evolution. What we talk about finished a long time ago. We are never already a subject of that kind of development. <laughs> It means that our physiology is invariant. No matter that we think we develop muscles, you see, like heartbeat. Lungs capacity, actually, it's all nonsense. The, and examples are there in science, but nobody see it because it, it's called conceptual darkness or ignorance <laughs> or something like that. I call one of the, my articles that were published in the past years is called、um, "Conceptual Trap <laughs> in Our Field," <laughs> which people are. <clears throat> and instead of being、uh, um, children of the world and explode help of the nature, they are trying to develop something what they cannot develop in themselves. You know, if we accept concept that evolution stops already and stopped long time ago, our efforts to develop. These physiological parameters are useless completely. We're just wasting time, you know. And I have proof about this, theoretical and practical. I already、okay. done this many times. I li I like what I'm hearing. This is very very interesting, and I and I have heard you talk about this, and your son has talked about this a little bit too. But I I want to explore it because I think it's it's、uh, extremely interesting. So.、Um, Let's dive into、uh, some of the, these concepts.、Uh, when, when you're talking about our evolution, are you saying that we have reached evolutionary stasis, meaning we right we're, we're done evolving as human beings?、Uh, it's correct because science、um, on that matter we're pretty much clear. It, it、um, statement like that. Biological organism, or <laughs> in science, it's called Open system <laughs> can be 
uh, moving in evolutionary development only if our environment will be changed. <laughs> Gravitational environments exist here on Earth already 4.5 billion years. <laughs> <laughs> you understand? <laughs> well, I, I can't. I can't even understand for four point five billion years. But I, I understand what you mean. Yes. <laughs> you, you see, it's like a, I'll give you a kind of humoristic answer. You know, when you get married and you are adopted to one lady, <laughs> it's very difficult to, from one point, to save your marriage. <laughs> <laughs> because you're looking for evolution <laughs> and there is no evolution and to love human being as it is as she is or from her side as you is ah. <laughs> it's quite difficult and challenging <laughs> problem <laughs> right uh, it, it makes sense so uh if if this is the case and uh uh, changing our physiology is uh, something that uh, when it comes to performance, let's just call it uh, uh, small. It's, it's, it's minimal. Uh, it's a myth. <laughs> it's a myth. Okay, so it's a complete myth. It, it, yes. So, for example, uh, are we born or when we, when we reach, let's say, the age of 25 and we're talking about something like VO2 max, mm -hmm. um, can VO2 max be improved on no. or can it just be accessed? Okay, <laughs> answer it exists already. And um, um, let me see. This. Uh, it's an American physiologist from uh, Illinois University. Um, I forgot his name, but well, it's just come up. Like, it's in 1998, it was published in his textbooks in physiology, sport physiology. Uh, I have a pages even like 112 probably. It's called like that. VO2 max could be developed from the point when you start work on this direction in 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 um, uh, twelve weeks. It means three months <laughs> to the plateau, <laughs> mm -hmm. and after that, forget it. <laughs> and it's proven many many times in the practice. And plus, um, VO2 max is uh, um, not developing, but uh, open air with your age like when you're born your child and goes up and age 18 20 it's like uh, you're picking there to then if you're not exercising you're picking to your top level of kind of uh, civil life you know normal without any exercising but after that if you start so you can add to this another 10 15 percent this is what three months will give you that's it. Your evolution yeah. finished. <laughs> that, that's that's very little, and and I think for somebody to hear that, especially somebody who's obsessed mm -hmm. uh, about numbers and All metrics right. and finding the data, and has a million trackers and is constantly going back to the lab to test. Um, yeah, that must be hard to swallow. Uh, uh, they want to kill you. <laughs> <laughs> so, so uh, 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 I know it's not your job, but how do you console them? For, furthermore, how, how do you how do you help the the athlete or the performer uh, reframe their mindset to focus on that which does improve their uh, abilities or maximize their outcomes? Carl, you should know already. You <laughs> practitioner, is this I'm field dumb. blocked? <laughs> I don't know anything. I don't know anything. Come on, come on, come on. Yes, yeah, Socrates told the same thing. You know. So you, you can't <laughs> overcome this <laughs> genius. The point is like that. Uh, when I meet people who come to me and they are kind of dumb in this case and they do not, I do not work with these people. <laughs> That's it. You know? Okay. Find somebody who will improve your VR to max. Go ahead. <laughs> I am not <laughs> the person. I am improving your performance. Not your VO2 max. I don't give a damn about your VO2 max as a matter of fact, you know. And I work with groups of people like 70, 60 preparing them for big marathons in a matter of, I have a special program for this, three, four months, you know. And I, I, I did the concern about the VO2 max. I did my program, which is developing performance skill. <laughs> and 
people who performed like that, uh, best of them, and they trained three, four times a week. Do you understand? Like, mm -hmm. They would improve time in the marathon one and a half hours. So, it, it, like in the movie, uh, you, uh, if it doesn't impress you, what I can give you more. <laughs> Average improvement was uh, about uh, 20 minutes in these groups. You know, it was normal people, you know. Mm -hmm. That's it. Yeah, very, very interesting. So, okay, uh, somebody uh, says, uh, Dr. Romanoff, I want to improve my performance. Um, let's just choose running because that's uh, part of what you're known for. But I know that your method transcends uh, running uh, as it applies to every single movement that uh, the human body is capable of performing. Uh, what's the checklist that you uh, go through um, in talking about performance? Yeah, Perception. Mm. Number one, it's perception. Tell I'm me not. More. I'm not the first one who told about this. Uh, if you will look through the history, for example, people uh, like um, Italian uh, emperor. You remember <laughs> this guy <laughs> uh, in in the movie, like Gladiator, <laughs> mm -hmm. <laughs> uh, philosopher, uh, emperor. He told them long time ago. Our life is only change and perception. And after him, lots of people told the same thing. Oh, before him, even Aristotle told the same thing. And then it came to the Leonardo da Vinci and so on. You know, these people were uh, insightful, you know, obviously <laughs> great minds. And, and then to, up to our days, and up to our time, that kind of understanding was repeated again and again and again and again. Basically, my teachers uh, understood this too, you know, not to, to that extent what I, I came through for our field, but it was clear that perception is an incredibly important thing. And when you say perception, are you referring to a frame of mind, a mindset, a belief system? <clears throat> Not. It's a, It's a, just a. Com, uh, it's a component of perception. <laughs> perception is. A, unfortunately, most people um, understand perception uh, as a sensory system. No, <laughs> it's like uh, confusion point. Like many scientific research was done around. The, Visual perception, for example. Uh, for example, James Gibson developed his uh, ecological psychology, where the perception was a major point of his research. But he came from the point of view of psychology. He was a pioneer, and his uh, science work, it's a, a brown, groundbreaking, you know. And I do respect him very much. You know, unfortunately, he uh, left to the better world in 1979, probably. And the last book of his perceptual ecology came through. But <clears throat> he understood only from this point. But uh, he understood um, of uh, our interaction with the world. You, you see, perception was instrumental in. Uh, how we interact with the world. And if we extend this understanding into the performance, that <laughs> is defined conceptual framework. So your perception is what defines how good you are in your development, in your field, in performance field. Mm. Yeah. Okay. So, so now this is where my mind is going and let's see if this aligns with your thinking and see if it evokes, uh, the next topic for us. So in my mind right now, I see three different aspects. I see physiology, which can be changed very little to nothing. I see, uh, mechanics, which is the way that we move through performance. And then I see environment. And it seems like all three of those uh, do play a role in producing the best performance outcomes. My sense is that you have spent a lot of time uh, teaching and talking about the mechanics of it through Poe's method, but 
helping people understand the physiology and the environment is is key. And then it seems like the the undercurrent or the thing that connects those is our relationship to it. And this gets a little now philosophical, maybe abstract, but um, it's very practical, actually. <laughs> okay. Okay. So are we are we aligned in in those three yes. categories? Okay. Right. Yeah, how does perception fit into those three? And um, help help me and whoever's listening right now understand why compartmentalizing them is important and why we can't separate them um, when we think about uh, performance as as a whole. Uh, it's it's an old problem, <laughs> philosophical problem, when we uh, telling that the world is one, you know. <laughs> We have to understand <laughs> it's, it's, it's in science it starts from structural understanding of the world. What does it mean structure? Translation from Greek so it means very simple thing. It's connection parts in the whole. You know? <laughs> and, and after that it exists organization of this whole. It's a um, it's a dynamic and functional part of the performance. Another thing, uh, what, what does it mean perception in this case? Perception is your capacity to interact with, with the world. And by that, I, I mean everything, how you interact with trees, with the sun, with that beautiful mountains which around me, uh, with a pretty girl, uh, and then who would become your wife with your kids, with your, with your grandkids. If your perception is uh, fraction or screwed up, it, it will bring lots of trouble. For example, if you think uh, in, in a simple way, <laughs> um, uh, example, <laughs> one funny movie was like, I remember this phrase, like if man thinking that this girl is not from his league, <laughs> you know, you, it's a perception. <laughs> You never get this girl. Mm -hmm. And in the famous movie, uh, the guy made it this <laughs> with a girl who was not from his league. <laughs> right. And everything comes to that point. If you think you are not high jumper, I, I was high jumper in my um, youth when I was young and handsome. <laughs> but uh, uh, if I wouldn't think that I am high jumper with, with my height, I'm gymnastics height five eight mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. you see but i become elite high jumper my records still in my school records my city where we're grown up <laughs> in my university still my records in high jumping do you understand how far away I, i'm not even telling you numbers because it's kind of a little bit disturbing <laughs> it's perception you see yeah I perceive myself as a high jumper, and from that, all came through. Mm -hmm. And uh, I perceive myself on the second year in university as a scientist. Mm -hmm. And it worked through uh, again, you know. Uh, some people came like my beautiful and very smart and <clears throat> very high level teachers came and started helping me. Uh, they gave me <clears throat> textbooks, uh, literature and science, which above my course, which I was studying, you know, I, I was in the faculty of physical culture, education and sport, but I studied physiology uh, on the uh, textbook by textbooks from medical universities. Mm -hmm. This is what I studied cybernetics, <laughs> general system theory. <laughs> And I start to read Kuhn, you know, <laughs> the structure of scientific revolution. <laughs> you understand? Yeah, I understand. And, and I entered into this field already because I perceived myself as a scientist. Mm -hmm. And then in 1977 came Paul's method. <laughs> mm -hmm. Right. Incredible. And it, it, I know you said this before, but because I want to make this conversation uh, a podcast that is a standalone, why running? Why did you choose running? Why not high jumping? <laughs> I didn't choose running, actually. <laughs> it was about track and field. I was the mm -hmm. track and field teacher. Mm -hmm. And I teach 
uh, my students who were completely different specialities. It was swimmers, cyclists, boxers, wrestlers, and so on. It's not track and field just. I taught track and field events. You see, obviously I was uh, coaching my university track and field team. That's a different story, you know. But in teaching, you have to give them quite substantial material and the process of teaching that in a very small course of like two, three sessions, lessons, to teach something very uh, difficult, um, technically speaking, events like uh, hurdles, throwing, like discus throwing, javelin throwing, uh, high jumping, you know, and um, five styles of high jumping at that time. It was a new program for the students. And I was puzzled, you know, I was felt myself like a, a broken, <clears throat> completely mind because three lessons and you have to give them technical event like that. Running was not there, <laughs> mm -hmm. but that was a problem which I was um, captivated. And wow. I found this a strange thing by that time, being track and field athlete myself, then uh, finishing with uh, on a diploma university, I found myself empty hand <laughs> when I came to teaching track and field. <laughs> there was no method of teaching. <laughs> Efficient, you know, <laughs> uh, very effective. No, and two years since I started work on the, my faculty, <laughs> my, my mind was like a <laughs> I feel ashamed because I was teaching something, but I am not sure that I'm teaching <laughs> what <laughs> and how. Wow. It, it, it was a sh very difficult s s stage you know, of going through the... You see, obviously, I couldn't admit them that I am dumb. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, so so, so the, the the technical language is that it was a shit show at first, <laughs> <laughs> right? Okay. So I very intensely moved into this field of learning what is movement mm -hmm. and what is a method. <laughs> it was ballet. Luckily, I had personal friends in leading. Uh, ballet dancers in our theater, you know, <laughs> who would invite me on the rehearsals, on premieres, and so on. I was quite educated in this case, and culturally and uh, methodologically. <laughs> and then I um, entered in the um, that martial arts. It, uh, um, it was practically a guy who was ten done on a black belt in a Kyushin Kai, and he was my teacher, and we became friends. He was a lawyer by itself, <laughs> but we hooked up and become friends. So I studied these things, and this puzzling question was like going through me, what the hell is the method? What are we supposed to teach? And then how, you know? Like <laughs> <laughs> That's a big one. <laughs> so, you see, biomechanics didn't give answer. It still didn't give an answer. Besides Paul's method, there is no answer on this matter. So, <clears throat> but I was lucky. Uh, usually in this case, telling like lucky bastard. <laughs> <laughs> that my curiosity about other things paid off. In one day, it, it came this aha moment inside. I'm like, like every car. Uh, Eureka in Greek. <laughs> it was exactly the day, the 11th October 1977. I do remember this very well still. You see, it's a, you understand, it's 46 mm -hmm. years <laughs> later. And I do yeah. remember this year because my younger daughter was born in this year. <laughs> wow. Yeah, that's a lot. So you had an, a, a, a Eureka moment. And this Eureka <clears throat> moment, um, can you can you guide me through that? Do you remember what it was like? Was it oh wow? Oh, pose. of course, absolutely. Yeah. It's clear. Yeah. It's yeah. up to it up to, to date. It's, a, it's like when because it's that question, what is movement, mm -hmm. was uh, buzzing inside you all the time, and what is important in movement was inside all the time, 
it's a kind of uh, what it's called latent period, you know, <laughs> or latent period in English. Mm -hmm. call it. In, in Russian, we call latent latent period. <laughs> mm -hmm. Period. It's cooking there. You see. Yeah. And one day it's always like boom out. I study um, um, uh, problem in science which call heuristic. Mm -hmm. And I read George Poya, <laughs> uh, Poincaré, you see, the, uh, Planck and so on. Einstein, of course, it's uh, all of this thing. And I uh, was thinking in terms of like, how they have been thinking about this, you know. And there are plenty of material was was inspirational, you know. And everywhere was that process, this like internal cooking and then mm -hmm. boom. You know, like that, and I came through exactly in this uh, uh, pattern, mm -hmm. and uh, um, boom was like that. It's very simple. Any movement is just an alternation of poses, among which are key poses, which define this movement. Clear, absolutely everything become clear. I run to my assistant. And ask him, start, I will dictate for you. And you start typing. You see this mechanical <laughs> machine, three copies. <laughs> Still couldn't find these copies in my library <laughs> in wow. the, back in Russia. You know, <laughs> I'm looking for this first uh, the prototype of this. <laughs> I came to give my wife, like, read this. And she's a philologist. She's a PhD in English philology. <laughs> And she told, first of all, that word pozny, pose, doesn't exist in Russian vocabulary. I told, I don't give a damn. I am a <laughs> creature. And we quarreled. And they said, okay, you have rights. Fantastic. <laughs> then, obviously, she went through the... Um, uh, that uh, expression, like, this is a wrong phrase, this is a wrong phrase. <laughs> I, I told, it's fine, it's a first one. <laughs> and then I wrote many, many different varieties of this um, first framework. <laughs> and the, now I have quite good <laughs> expression of this idea in many aspects of that. <laughs> mm -hmm. And And when... When and how did um, it come together where you said, okay, in running specifically? Oh, it's, uh, oh yeah. it's, it was easy, very much. You know? okay. Then, because I, before that, I mm, went through so many movies. It was no videos by that time, you understand. So I went through the movies, this uh, um, different millimeters, like uh, eight or 16. <laughs> <laughs> and with uh, this 24, <laughs> this uh, <coughs> sequence of frame, and I work on the table where the uh, movie guys making uh, what is called <laughs> like lacing stop, stop motion. Yes, right. And I checking like what is that? What is that? I was looking for very simple thing. What is common? I went through the running, jumping, throwing, everything. You see. Track and field was my uh, intention. When I found that concept, pose, oh, I immediately understood this, 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 this pose. <laughs> because biomechanics already was there. I was teaching biomechanics and I, the, uh, I, I connected immediately two parts, you know, like pose and body weight. Mm. It came through immediately, you know. <clears throat> and pose, another psychological aspect is uh, like, Pose has intention. <laughs> like when people tell you, is pose is a posture? No. Posture has no intention. Pose has intention. If snake like that in the pose, you know intention of the snake. <laughs> if yeah. dog like standing like that, it's intention. <laughs> and people's, yes. uh, people's mindset and poses exactly the same way it goes. It's a very deep uh, surviving things would develop um, in our field uh, in a gravity in, in order to uh, effectively interact with the environment. You have to have good pose where body weight will be available. Otherwise, you couldn't fight. You couldn't run. You couldn't 
punch, you could shoot and so on. Pose mm -hmm. should be related with the body weight. And that pose should have intention of that exactly um, um, execution of your intention. Mm -hmm. That is how it works. It makes total sense. And this is the first time I've heard you say it this way. And although it had landed for me before, it landed slightly different today, which when you said uh, posture versus pose, um, it, it pose being deliberate makes so much sense because that's that's what practice really is. And it, if we were to take something superficial, it's kind of strike strike a pose for a picture, right? Strike a pose, <laughs> De pose deliberately, position yourself. Um, I really like that, and it and it and it gives me a greater sense for the intention portion and how it actually. Uh, relates to perception. Okay, we're coming to the point. Mm -hmm. What is perception for? <laughs> right, right. So uh, it, as of right now, my rudimentary take on it is that by understanding that a pose can, can move you closer to gaining perception and perception can gain, uh, help you move closer to a pose, uh, you're, it's almost like you're bringing these two lanes together into this peak there are one important component is not yet <laughs> in our conversation tell me, tell me. <laughs> it's environment <laughs> yes okay so that was part of the, the the original question and 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 let's get back to that because one of the things that i'm thinking about is uh i forget the athlete now and i i apologize but uh, the 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 one who uh broke the two hour uh, marathon but had to create a very Elliot specific Kipchoge. environment mm -hmm. right versus the person who broke the four minute mile, different environment. Um, yeah, so let, let's get into environment. Talk to me about environment and how it affects these, these things we're talking about. Um, first of all, in, environment of nature should be on the first place, you see. Mm -hmm. uh, I have to a little bit make a detour, scientific detour. Let's do because uh, <clears throat> we uh, as a biological organisms, we live in a very simple but very structured world. You see, when people telling, "Oh, we are so different," it's a, uh, it's a, lying by ignorance, <laughs> or lying by uh, pride, <laughs> or something like that. We are not different. Absolutely not. Our differences is completely uh, could be neglected, basically. <laughs> And it comes to difference in perception, basically. Um, we as a biological uh, organism live in in an environmental exchange. It's called um, floating uh, uh, floating uh, current. Current of what? Energy, substance, and information. It's constant exchange. If we stop somewhere else, our life is ruined completely, up to death. And uh, back in the 50s, for example, Germans made very uh, horrible <laughs> experiment, psychophysiological <laughs> and perceptive. It was a group of people who were put um, one by one in the camera, which was isolated from the world, no noise, no light, uh, no information, and uh, it was a uh, water uh, with the temperature of the um, body. And uh, additionally, it's uh, uh, salted water. The body floated like in a dead sea. <clears throat> you just lie down there. Like a deprivation <clears throat> thing. Yeah. It's, this is what I would call it. It's called sensory deprivation experiment. <laughs> this mm. is what <laughs> was the original thing. <laughs> okay. <laughs> what happened over there? Horrible. Never again, nobody uh, took liberty to repeat this because no one first uh, maintained more than uh, 24 hours. People were broken before that. And some people were heavily broken. They lost uh, senses, uh, senses of lights, senses of taste and many things like that. It was a horrible <laughs> experiment, you know. And the, what does the sensory deprivation means? Means 
<laughs> cutting yourself from the world. Floating on information stops. What happened? Brain goes crazy, completely. It's called system of reference was lost. <laughs> we live in the system of reference all the time. It's like you, me, that wall, table, other people, this city, and so on. If it's that disappeared, your brain disappeared as well. Brain works as a copy, saving patterns of the world, and this is what our process of thinking. Mm. This is how our intelligence is developing. And people don't understand this, you know. It's a strange thing. Even so many books written about these things. And one of the uh, main books I would recommend, it's um, <clears throat> Jeff Hawking's, uh, it's called On Intelligence, 2004. It was published. Uh, okay. <clears throat> sorry. <clears throat> so, uh, due to continue this, uh, this yeah. case, um, so our main thing is how we building and or developing our relationship with the environment. And first environmental factor is gravity. That thing is defined in, in many cases, our capacity to interact, to live a healthy and good life. And most people, not aware about this completely, an educational system completely in the dark on this matter. We have to teach first how to interact. If in psychology we're teaching how to interact human to human, you know, and we're telling this is the laws of interaction, you know, and the perception is there, the key element how we interact, you know. So you have to develop perception for others of yourself as a nice, pleasant, and uh, in, in interactable man, you know, <laughs> teachable or coachable. If not, you will be dumped from society. <laughs> yeah. Okay. Yeah. What do you think nature thinks the same way? <laughs> Lawrence Gonzalez, in his book, Deep Survival, told nature doesn't adjust to your level of skill. <laughs> that is a, a harsh uh, truth and, and an interesting one to, to ponder. Um, I, I want to be careful here to not digress too 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 far away. Uh, but the, the, something that's coming up for me, I don't know if you've heard or read uh, Lisa Feldman Barrett. She's um, a, a doctor in neuroscience, and she um, has a book called How Emotions Are Made. And uh, her theory and what she is doing research on in her lab says that um, one of the things that our brain does is it constructs an emotion to um, uh, tell the body to prepare for what it's predicting is going to happen. And this emotion becomes the lens through which we see the world. It becomes uh, how we perceive the world. Um, are you familiar with her work? Uh, not, do you have any um, thoughts on what I just shared? Not, uh, I'm not uh, familiar. It didn't come, but um, I studied this thing deeply, and I uh, was... Uh, <clears throat> acquainted to with uh, one of the uh, top scientists in Soviet Union who developed a theory of emotions <laughs> uh, that <laughs> I was lucky <laughs> and I had the discussion with him and he, uh, obviously studied his book uh, books and his theory uh, is like uh, it's called informational <laughs> theory of emotions mm which open up everything because it's a physics behind it. The brain right. uh, forming emotions, not, uh, not like that. Information is uh, forming emotions. The mm -hmm. uh, essence of that theory, informational theory of emotions, um, lies on very um, simple assumption that uh, emotions are product of our certainty or uncertainty of this world, <laughs> of the mm -hmm. amount of uh, uh, or probability of event happening, you see? 
It's yeah. incredibly simple theory. <laughs> It's simple, uh, but for humans, uh, it seems like it's hard for us to navigate it sometimes. And Oops. this kind of takes us back to relationship to nature, relationship to gravity. Yeah, where were you going with uh, the relationship to gravity and maybe teaching that as, a, as part in, of basic education? Every single moment uh, we interact in gravity, the work for us 24 7. But we saw. Uh, become it's like uh, uh, somebody lives uh, nearby you and you see every day you know it's like this man kind of or woman uh, disappeared from your, your perception <laughs> it's become habits of so heavy ingrained in your body that you do not see it do not feel it which is a bad idea this is how many marriages were <laughs> ruined <laughs> mm -hmm. You have to understand the value of that thing what given to us by nature as a gift. Appreciate this, but we, another side, not appreciation only. You have to know what the hell is that in, the, in order to interact in the proper way. Mm -hmm. Gravity doesn't give a damn about you, but you have to give uh, thoughts about this and respect this and act accordingly to the requirement or mandatory of gravity, which people don't do. I will well, just give you... Yeah, a, a scientists and astronauts do, of course. They go out to space to uh, uh, do I'll experiment. give you a story about this, you know. <laughs> okay. I, I, I was lucky. I met people who were on the, on the beginning of the space studies in Soviet Union. I met this person it's, uh, as a separate story for separate... Payment. For a separate time. <laughs> <laughs> I'm joking, usually, but separate payment. <laughs> okay. <laughs> Look, um, Chinese philosopher, con contemporary of, um, uh, uh, of Confucius, Lao Tzu, Chongzu. I am using his quote all the time. Like, Pain is a penalty for violating principle of nature. Mm. 600 BC... <laughs> You want or you don't want, this is what truth. <laughs> yes. And this all is, our this injuries is, this are. Is, this is what we could call the, the ancient technology of the future. It's kind of like. Right. Confucius had the same kind of quote in a little bit different phrasing, but the same thing, you know. <laughs> yeah. I am a kind of a, uh, admirer of the. Uh, Chinese ancient philosophy. It's really high level wisdom. Mm -hmm. It's still mm -hmm. in China, you know, but um, modern Chinese are a little bit detour from this. It's so pity, you know, that having such a high level wisdom own, yeah. <laughs> own, <laughs> they do not respect this. But well, again, uh, yeah, the, the, the whole uh, idea of philosophy. Uh, and uh, wisdom over time is interesting. I mean, uh, we both live in the United States at the moment, and um, my sense is that this country, and this is uh, not an attack on the country or anything like that, but it doesn't carry ancient traditions in their modern day living. So you have to seek out some of this uh, wisdom elsewhere. Yeah. So I, 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 I can understand that you, you would appreciate um, ancient Chinese philosophy and I'll give you lots of examples how in modern time people, uh, particularly who consider themselves runners, they have no idea about running. It, not in terms of technique, obviously. There are even scientists who have very blurry understanding of that. We're talking about history. When I start my um, uh, sport um, in Dover, in high jumping, what I did first, I study everything about high jumping back in the history names greatest achievements styles people and so on you see and our one of the greatest writers russian writer leo tolstoy told about this very simple thing he told study past and move in the future very good advice you know <laughs> But uh, people come to me and I tell you, I'm a runner. I'm like, okay, let me give you a dumb question, you know. Uh, who is the um, 
<laughs> Pao Nurmi, <laughs> for example. <laughs> oh, who is Emil Zatopek? Oh, Roger Bannister, and so on, you know? Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. None. Mm -hmm. So w when the women entered into the running field in Olympic Games, long distance, marathon, Oh gosh! It's uh, you see. This is what questions are, which you lost. You know, you rem remember was a um, fight, a war with women who entered in the Boston Marathon. Remember, it, it, it's a poor. You know, dumb people decided not to allow women. Now, women's record closer to the men's record. <laughs> Two minutes more shave off. <laughs> You see, mm -hmm. this is what, how you um, be someone, you know, like a, I'm Formula One driver. Okay. Who is Schumacher? <laughs> right. What kind of cars over there? What's their main things in the, this circle of driving? <laughs> you know, they don't know. No, then you are not Formula One driver. <laughs> mm -hmm. Yeah. Yes. Yeah, I guess studying your contemporaries is definitely important um, and becoming uh, acquainted with them. I'm curious now, let's go back to uh, performance environment. Um, do you, as somebody who cares about performance, educate others on creating environments for producing better performance? Or is that not it's your it's business? A, not it's a part of my business, as you're saying, you know. <clears throat> uh, you remember ancient Greek famous saying on the uh, temple of uh, Apollo? <laughs> uh, get to know yourself. <laughs> mm -hmm. This is uh, good advice. <laughs> mm -hmm. That is the environmental frame. <laughs> It, is that an internal environment or also the external environment? No, uh, get to know yourself. It means not only how you feel yourself, like, and so on. It's how you interact with the world. Mm. You see, that is uh, what Greeks' um, meaning was about these things. Uh, they understood nature as a common laws of nature. Nature is a Latin word. It's a translation from Greek physica. Physica, it's a, it's a science about most common laws of nature. This is how uh, Aristotle called it, you know, F foodies, you know, <laughs> where, where it's coming from, where it's born from. This is what in his book, Physica, um, uh, number three, uh, the chapters five and six, probably, uh, as I do remember. I don't know, people do not read Aristotle. Why? <laughs> he gave lots of answers over there, <laughs> mm -hmm. at, at least for me. <laughs> now, shifting gears, um, I want to talk about when you give um, a lecture or a talk or you're addressing a room of individuals who are there to learn from you, if you had to choose or maybe you, you, you always open with the same thing, but if you had to choose one topic to start with, what, what is that topic and how do you address it? Uh, what our um, uh, purpose of this meeting? <laughs> let's say that again. Oh, so the purpose of the meeting, uh, let, let's say it's, uh, I don't know, where, where are you today? Who are you working with? Um, with U.S. Uh, Army. Okay, so let's say it's the U.S. Army. Uh, if you're talking to the U.S. Army, what are they seeking to get from you? That's the first question I would ask you. But then uh, how would you open up to address them? What's the uh, first thing? First of all, they know? don't know what they're seeking from me because they don't know what they're seeking for themselves. You see, we are opening for them and unfolding them what they need and what they should be looking for. Mm -hmm. That is the point. And... Uh, um, very simple statistics is telling what they need. You see, running is the most injury <laughs> uh, uh, risk in army. Do you understand? It's a 10 million duty days lost every year. Almost $600 million lost <laughs> because of injuries in running wow. and losing my U.S. Army soldiers from duties and so on. 
that is what like can you <laughs> absorb this for yourself this information do you understand what you're dealing with if you are in our uh, uh, contingent is, is um, drill sergeant and physiotherapist do you understand what you're dealing with you have to work in a preventive way not uh, <laughs> trying to solve problem when it happened already why we start working with army because they saw how post method works over there post method now in USA health and fitness doctrine by the name because they saw results and up to the uh, top generals in the Pentagon and in the Congress you see it's not because I'm nice looking gentleman <laughs> but besides that oh come on you know it was a long time ago <laughs> right now I don't I, I don't give a damn about this. because beauty is not in the, that face look because Socrates was an ugly man by the uh, understanding of um, but he was one of the most beautiful men you see Aesopus was incredibly ugly man but he had top highest lovers from the royalty <laughs> who loved him you know because beauty is not um, just um, opening up <laughs> for your eyes you know <laughs> gaze no beauty is a very interesting thing <laughs> mm -hmm. yeah and i and i love i love the philosophical side of this because something that i've i've always said is especially when trying to set a standard everybody is looking for what what's the way show me uh, give me the playbook tell me what the steps are uh, I've always said, uh, look, look for beauty. Usually when you see beauty in high performers and you're able to see it in, in a way that just charms you beyond just the aesthetics, um, you realize that their, their, uh, their way of performing tends to have uh, some sort of mechanical advantage. And it also matches the rules of a game or a sport. And I'm wondering, is, is Pose Method teaching beauty and performance and human performance of course everything what uh, <clears throat> building much better relationship with nature is it, it's, it's called uh, um, uh, sensibility you know like a sense development of relationship you see um, the point is uh, that um, if you remember this name uh, Etienne Julius Marais, the, uh, the, who started science in our field, basically, you see, one of the first scientists, French guy, who was involved um, with the military of France, and they, they uh, paid for his research how to make movement of soldiers better, you see, and he developed this thing, and his famous book is um, La Movement. 1972 and published 1995. And I do remember his saying one like, the truth which coming first time opening for your eyes look very ugly. <laughs> you understand? Perception. Mm -hmm. Truth doesn't be related with the beauty the first time. Mm -hmm. It's a process of developing relationship, and only in the process you understand what is beautiful or what is not. Mm. And the post method is teaching how to better, more efficient interact with the environment and with yourself. You see, it's a kind of between. You are just an intermediate, translating the energy in out, <laughs> matter in and out, information in and out. And how you manage this is what beauty is. <laughs> yeah, sorry, yes. sorry for interrupting, but I just remembered something. Uh, when I finished my lecture uh, at Princeton <clears throat> that you attended, uh, at the end of the, the lecture, you did come up to me and say, I loved it. Thank you so much. One thing, uh, we cannot create movement. Absolutely. <laughs> it's and that's that very I well said. known. <laughs> <laughs> it's a very well known thing in physics. <laughs> so so if I want to move my hand towards you right now, I can't create that movement. 
we are operating with motion. Uh, in philosophical aspects of this uh, phenomena, movement is a phenomena which we're dealing. Uh, world, given world, is given to us in movement. You see, this is a major philosophical part of this understanding. No movement, no world. Mm -hmm. And uh, we're coming to the first law of the thermodynamic. Uh, it, its statement is like that. <clears throat> Energy cannot be created or destroyed. It could be only transferred from one uh, form to another. And you have to understand that energy and movement is interrelated, but there are very interesting middlemen over there. It's called matter, <laughs> substance. Because without matter, energy cannot be mobile. This was said in 1957 by the great scientist um, St. Georgi, Albert St. Georgi, double uh, uh, Nobel Prize winner and uh, found, <laughs> he was an incredible guy, he found um, vitamin C, you know. <laughs> okay, uh, yeah. short story. <laughs> so, uh, <clears throat> movement in energy, it's a kind of um, Gemini's, you know, <laughs> like two siblings. <laughs> they are not separated, they cannot live separately. And um, phenomenal equation of the Albert Einstein E equal mass C square is a, that marriage, not never broken, you know? Mm -hmm. Less mass, more speed, <laughs> right. velocity. <laughs> Less velocity, more uh, mass <laughs> substance. Mm -hmm. And um, that high level is a high level vibration here what we see um, a material body like my table, me, it's a low vibration. <laughs> mm -hmm. You see? Yep. That is what we have to understand. <laughs> and yep. it exists. And we are in that non-stop current of movement existing. And uh, gravity, one of these currents, mm -hmm. which uh, are governing and ruling, how planetary relationship established and they are moving in the circle motion. Why circular? Because <clears throat> masses could hold by gravitational law each other. You see, mm -hmm. bigger mass holding around and that constellation holding another <laughs> constellation. That's why they are moving in a circle. That's why we can predict when they come to this point, you know. If there will be linear movement, not elliptical, circular, we would never know when uh, somebody come up to us again. But we know exactly <laughs> and calculate when this meteor <laughs> come up to us again, you know. Mm -hmm. That is the movement. And we're part of this. We're just flying together with that. And motion, <laughs> this is what we live in. This. <laughs> we're basically jumping in the current of gravity. And we... Who is better does it? Like jumping on a, on a boat down the mountain river. This is what gravity is for us. Mm -hmm. And who is a better does this interaction with this moving current? They are better in movement. <laughs> right. So it's uh, movement is um, movement is. And, and and motion is our uh, interaction or how we are uh, expressing ourselves through the movement. Uh, and I, I'm trying to put this in words that potentially translates to to where I want to go with it. And and our our relationship to this allows us to interact with that movement in different ways. It seems like pose method is what allows you to maximize your performance. Pose is the gate. Pose is mm -hmm. the gate for this energy, mm -hmm. external energy. We don't have our own energy. What we consider our energy, like a ATP, 
It's not our. <laughs> it came from right. the sun, <laughs> through the uh, um, grasses, um, and then the grasses eat animals, and we eat animals, uh, and uh, some growing plants we eating. It's a sun's energy, <laughs> not mm -hmm. ours. <laughs> We're just <laughs> right. digesting this, <laughs> consuming. Right. Consuming, exactly, consuming. And for those who are consuming the information that we're sharing today and that you're, you're uh, sharing with me in this conversation, uh, I, I think they're also now curious, okay, if Poe's method starts with perception, what comes next if we had a linear progression, if that even exists? Um, uh, it's an in scientific definition of these things. Um, we have to uh, create a so-called system of reference. Physics operate with that. So mm -hmm. everything relatively to s something, <laughs> mm -hmm. you see? And you are in, in the frame which we call system of reference. You live in that relationship. And there are what we call um, reference point. It means something very substantial for your living which make, uh, uh, makes biggest impact on your existence. And you have to understand what is that and how to interact with that, to consume it for your good. <laughs> mm -hmm. Yeah, that makes sense. So um, when it comes to the mechanics, the expression of the mechanics through Poe's method, what is it that you address first? Is it the pose itself? Is it a center mass and relationship to your base of support? Is it uh, talking about gravity and your relationship to your center of mass? Where, yeah, where do you it's, go uh, in the conversation? Yeah, that's a, a difficult part. You know, uh, it, it's related with um, difficulty related to background of people. Mm -hmm. You have to consider uh, very much who you, your students right now, on which level, you see, and you have to be very careful because, unfortunately, uh, unknown things, what you're addressing to people which are not educated to or with, mm -hmm. could insult them, you know, because it's kind of you blaming them. Like uh, when you're asking, do you know what is gravity? It, you already put question upside down, you know, and they're like, <laughs> they send you back signal like that. <laughs> you see, you have to be incredibly polite um, to deliver this message, you know, and you're telling, okay, we are dealing with these things. In order to run, you have to consume some energy, not force. This is what biggest misleading things in biomechanics and physics. Uh, to, because for physics, phys physicist, for me mechanicists, they don't give a damn about that because force is a way of description how material bodies interact between each other. But mm -hmm. for teaching movement, it's not important really, completely. Right. What kind of forces you're dealing with? I am honest. This mm -hmm. is what Paul's theory concept. Right. Uh, because for us, most important, where the energy comes from and how to consume this energy because... But again, definition of physics, it goes like that. What does it mean energy? Energy is the capacity to produce work. What does it mean running is work. So we mm -hmm. have to look not for forces. <laughs> we have to look for energy, mm -hmm. which energy we are consuming in this way and how. And pose in this case is a, is a tool of consuming this energy and transferring into the movement. Mm -hmm. Because work, it's a way of transferring energy in movement. It's physics, again, thermodynamics. <laughs> mm -hmm. Yeah, exactly. So, um, of course, everybody uh, wants to improve, get better, perform better. And uh, if uh, perpetual motion... Um, didn't require energy, it would be beautiful. We would just <laughs> be, be, right? It's a good uh, but, dream. <laughs> it's a good dream. But because we are um, uh, part of this environment that has um, gravity, uh, we, we need energy to remain in motion. And one of the things that I believe you teach, and, and maybe I'm, I'm mistaken here, so please uh, correct me. One of the things that I believe you teach is how to be more energy efficient 
and how yes, to be more mechanically course. effective. Right, um, everything comes to this point. Mm -hmm. What how... do you start with? The effectiveness of the mechanics or the efficiency of... Um... This the topics, uh, um, notions um, coming later. First, okay. we have to consider at all to understand what has been necessary uh, to have in your possessions as the resources of your movement and then after that only how to efficiently use it, you see? Mm -hmm. People should be very clear that there are not much resources around. When people start thinking of their own muscles and the, that uh, airway capacity, they are in trap. Mm -hmm. I, I'll give you an example. Just the, look, <clears throat> you remember a case when Lance Armstrong decided to run marathon in New York? Yes. Okay, he's a uh, via uh, to max, <laughs> incredible, 84. <laughs> I mean, but his marathon time wasn't that the, impressive. A piece of crap. <laughs> <You know? laughs> he barely ran under three hours, you know. Mm -hmm. well, this is what telling you who is who and what is more important, you know. And then now, ladies who have much less via to max <laughs> running <laughs> so much. Yeah, fast or whatever it was yes right no average is people who run right now with these ladies they are about uh, 55 to 65 do you understand 84 and this mm -hmm. but they run so much faster marathon okay so the question is how do we run faster it's about how much gravity you can consume mm -hmm. this is first and number one uh, problem in question, which I'm addressing to my students. It's not about breathing, heart rate, and so on. It's tools to see how he is interacting, wrong or right. You see, mm -hmm. that is only I'm using for. I don't concern completely about these kind of parameters or physiological parameters into these things. Um, <clears throat> uh, my concern is like how big angle I can develop of falling for my student. Mm -hmm. And whole training process align around this uh, conceptual frame. Yeah. So, uh, okay, so for those who are listening, in pose, uh, of course it's pose, then it's uh, the lean or the fall, and then Not it's lean the pull. Fall. <laughs> yeah, it's, it's, it, it's the, and then comes the pull, correct? Yes. Um, the more you can you can uh, lean, the further fall. you can lean. The, fall. <laughs> what, Sorry. You, you call fall. it falling. Okay. Absolutely. So you, because we okay. are consuming gravity. Gravity comes uh, as a free falling. All right. Fantastic. So uh, let, let's make sure we get that right. So falling. The more you can fall, uh, the more capacity you have to uh, yes. have to consume gravity. Thus, you need to pull faster, right? Because you need to meet the it's ground. A, it's a component, a uh, necessary component for this. Yes. Okay. So um, is that where one must start thinking about improving uh, rather than thinking about, okay, I need to increase my cardiovascular capacity? The cardiovascular capacity, as I told, it's a dumb thing. It's a consequence, you know. It's happened. Mm -hmm. You want or you don't want. In three months of uh, regular training, you will be on the top level of your capacity with given you genetically. It's called genetically predisposed factor. What I can say more for this. It's written in the textbooks, you know. Why people not reading this, I don't understand. Mm -hmm. <laughs> But, right, but our resource in running faster only that falling angle mm -hmm. of falling. Mm -hmm. I'll give you numbers just because I calculated all these yeah, things. I study, like, let's say, like Usain Bolt. People know who is Usain Bolt, right? Mm -hmm. Okay, uh, this is a white guy from Europe, right? <laughs> I'm joking. <laughs> His angle of falling was. In his um, fastest run, 9.58 9, on the Berlin uh, World Championship in 2009, was um, 21.4. <clears throat> wow. Maximum angle. Average was 8.5. 8 
Is there a, because is there an accelerating point, you know, angle, that's why it's average. <clears throat> Eliud Kipchoge, mm -hmm. he, in his run under two hours marathon, you, you re remember this in Eos 2019? Yeah. I when mean, he, he had a pacer, he had, uh, yeah, he had right. people running with him. That He created an amazing environment and a show that was incredible to watch. Okay. Biggest angle in, in the field of marathon ever in history. 17.03 degrees. Mm. Nobody before and after run like that. And wow. himself as well. This is a physics, complete physics. You know, I wrote about this in my articles. It's called Geometry of Running published in the European <laughs> uh, conferences, <clears throat> but nobody pay attention. <laughs> well, I, I'm paying attention right now, and I hope those listening are paying attention. Gentlemen. <laughs> uh, <laughs> well, thank you. Uh, I'll, I'll take it. Um, it's fascinating because it, it really is a paradigm shift that uh, seems to have been occurring really slowly <laughs> because I, I first heard of you probably in 2008 uh, through Brian McKenzie and CrossFit. And when I first read uh, your book and I started to learn what you were teaching, my mind could not comprehend that something so simple and so obvious was the solution to the problems that most people were looking for. And yet, even with the evidence there, uh, refu refusing... <laughs> <laughs> refusing to, um, yeah, re reframe their minds and the way, their their perspectives on performance. And I'm I'm wondering why is it so hard for us <laughs> in the performance field to be able to it, look at it from this perspective? It's called very simple in psychology. It's a prison of mind. <laughs> yeah. We're yeah. living in the um, self-developed um, uh, society, developed paradigm. This mm -hmm. is what uh, Thomas Kuhn uh, wrote in the 60s, you know, when his uh, revolutionary book, uh, The Structure of Scientific Revolution in 1962, came out. It was like shock <laughs> mm -hmm. in scientific world. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Um, so this is something that is is uh, maybe philosophical, but also practical is um, it's things that sell are the things that become part of people's uh, mindsets and cultures and ways of doing things. And something that in CrossFit sold was the, 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 the culture of intensity and uh, yeah, just doing this together and suffering together. And that intensity was was one of the um, ways of accessing the highest level of performance. And, and I know that you, you uh, were invited and, and were talking to Greg Glassman. And I think, if I'm not mistaken, when in the early days when they did the uh, level one certification, uh, you were on day three, Sunday, an SME, a subject matter expert. Uh, was, was, was that moment for you a moment where you said, wow, okay, maybe this community, maybe this way is open to seeing things from my perspective and from what I've discovered? Or was it was it just another um, moment in time that was just fleeting? Not this um, uh, CrossFit community I um, get to know through Mackenzie, Brian Mackenzie. Mm -hmm. And I start read about this, and for me, it, it, it makes sense because it's immediately um, remind for me our Soviet Union program, which called GPP program, mm -hmm. which developed at the uh, at the end of the twenties, last century. That program developed and it came out as a get a all, you know. It's like be ready for the uh, defense uh, country, you know. Mm -hmm. And uh, it was a program for all sports uh, inside all level of sports, starting from the um, children's school. Uh, uh, GPP become like foundation. And the concept was like from general preparation, we're moving to the specialization and the top performance like that, like pyramid. Mm -hmm. 
-hmm. And it works very well, actually, you know. And that's why, for me, CrossFit in this case wasn't like, bomb. I'm like, wow, it's great. They created this and put in such a nice package, you know, which Glassman done this. He's a brilliant man, you know. And he created, in my mind, never was creating like business thing, but he was very creative and created environment, society, uh, fitness society, and business, you know, the incredible company. Probably no one made it like him successfully or both. And I like CrossFit community because it's uh, most devoted to the level of uh, uh, obsession. <laughs> obsession. <laughs> obsession. <laughs> People, very sincere, very friendly. It's like family, like things. And uh, in my mind, it was the best fitness community in the world most successful community in the world and uh, on a proper foundation what uh, Greg Glassman d developed, you see. Mm -hmm. N not with everything I agree with it, but I accept it openly and friendly, absolutely everything. And uh, he invited me to be in this community and I found very comfortable to be there. And I, I developed uh, many friendship and colleagues whom I was teaching. We taught lots of people in CrossFit around the world. I travel uh, for this through continents, like in China, in, in um, Korea, in Japan, um, uh, New Zealand, Australia, everywhere in, in CrossFit communities. I was teaching poles. Amazing. <laughs> it's still there. <laughs> As you know, <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. It's uh, it's incredible. It's it's the gift that keeps on giving, and I think uh, it's it's an interesting thing. And 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 I think one of the things that I was alluding to is that uh, that which sells, um, yeah, it becomes popular and becomes accepted. And uh, a curiosity I have when when Nike and uh, uh, running or jogging uh, became a thing w was that a positive thing for you and your business or uh, was it something that um, <clears throat> yes uh, of course set you back no no not at all and, uh, this is controversy you see we, we have to uh, human beings it's all society is always in controversy we have mm -hmm. to give a credit for bill bauman for example uh, for uh, founding Nike. Mm -hmm. you, you see, it, I have to give credit him, but developing shoes like this veg shoes is dumb thing was, you know, <laughs> mm -hmm. and his, his, his striking things, which he advocated, it was not good for running community. But in 1962, he was traveling to New Zealand, to Auckland, and, and meet these uh, crazy people over there <laughs> who are running <laughs> these uh, jogging things, <laughs> which become after that. Um, and he took this uh, virus of jogging from New Zealand and brought to um, United States. In 1967, he wrote classical book, Jogging, which is uh, bestseller, you know, and, and create running boom, you know, actually. So we have to understand this is good things. And <laughs> I study his work <laughs> deeply, you know. Uh, so it's good and not good. You see this kind of, he would say in this book on the first page is like, the most important is that you run, not how you run. Oh my goodness. It's like, it's like encouraging uh, ignorance, you know. <laughs> yeah. You're killing me. You're killing me. Right, right. <laughs> but I have deep respect to this man, you know. He was an incredible devotee, an incredible man. Unfortunately, he screwed up uh, Prefontaine's career, you know. Mm -hmm. And he admitted this himself. I have to give him again credit for that, you know. But mm. nevertheless, he screwed up him, you know. Yeah. Yeah, it's uh, fascinating. Uh, I, I want to go one one last topic before we we bring this to a close, which is uh, tools and technology. So, for example, when when I was deep in the CrossFit world and and Nike came in. Uh, they created the shoe uh, for a CrossFit called the Metcon. And this Metcon was, of course, designed for you to run, lift, and do some gymnastics. 
And from my vantage point, gymnastics, which is my, my specialty, one of the things that I noticed is that they created on the heel a little a plastic it's um, for weightlifting <laughs> uh, well no the, the the thing that they created was to slide up and down a wall while they were doing handstand push-ups and the reason they created it on the heel on this on the back of the the shoe was so you could slide up and down but it was because uh the crossfit games had created a standard for handstand push-ups that said a heel has to go over a line but the problem with that is that it was conducive for developing a movement pattern that was not the most effective and efficient movement pattern when it comes to performing handstand push-ups. So in many ways, the tool was becoming detrimental to the performance. It's kind of was a wrong assumption. You see, it's, it's happened like wedge shoes, assumption, wrong mm -hmm. assumption. That uh, cushioning shoes, wrong assumption. <clears throat> Viper flies, <laughs> another one. Mm -hmm. Right now, it's uh, Adidas <laughs> what, uh, came through this marathon record of this woman, you know. Mm -hmm. uh, but you have to ask uh, how many people run in these shoes and improve their performance? Oh, good, <laughs> good answer. Yeah, <laughs> zero. Yeah, um, <laughs> totally. Um, and I'm wondering how much the uh, how much do you have to work? And this is uh, now just a curiosity. How much work do you have to put in to be able to dig through all of the nonsense and noise that is in the performance space to be able to get to the root cause and uh, to that which needs to be addressed in order to make us better and perform better? It's a good question. <clears throat> from one side, it's easy to answer, and from another side, it's a, it's a complex answer. I will give you a simple answer, you know. I follow roots of the great people. And the main thing, what they devoted their lives, it's uh, seeking the truth. N not career development. Uh, some of them were ostracized for what they were <laughs> found, <laughs> you know. This is what all about. Truth doesn't belong to anyone. And truth, uh, not a lady from the bordel, you know. <laughs> you cannot buy it. Uh, truth mm -hmm. is opening to someone who really <laughs> wants to know the truth, you know. <laughs> this is what you need to know. <laughs> you cannot buy truth <laughs> by anything. You, you cannot confuse truth with anything. Yeah. So this yeah. is simple answer. Beautiful. Beautiful. Well, thank you for sharing your truth and for continuing to uh seek truth in in your work. Uh, I I am inspired and you have been uh although from afar a, a mentor to me and somebody that I I look to for for guidance when I'm thinking about some of these simple yet convoluted topics at times and um I, I appreciate you dedicating so much time to me today and to thank you to, Carl, to talk to, to me yeah for inviting me for this conversation because i always remember you as a smart and very nice person <laughs> and i never changed this <laughs> opinion about you and you prove one more time for me it's a uh, pleasure to meet you again <laughs> Thank you. Thank you. Well, such a pleasure. I, I, I look forward to more. And for now, I'm, I'm going to end the recording and, and we'll, we'll do this uh, another time. Um, All right. Thank you. This is the Freestyle Way.